All right, it's working. Clay pots. We've got a little bit of an array here, but they're all pretty much the same thing. But they come in all shapes and sizes, and we use them for a lot of different things. But these ones are pretty specific, what we're using them for. We're us we usually use them for flowers. But I mean, these are, some of these look a little bit better. Some have been around a while. Some are cracked. Some are corroding. They're all different. And this one is a lot prettier. It's kind of a, more of a pretty flower pot up there. So what do we use clay pots for? Plants, flowers, these ones specifically. How about other kinds of clay pots? Is there other kinds of things you can use? Storing food? Eating food, yeah. I know, yeah, that's what I should have dug out. I have some bread clay pots. I forgot all about in my cupboard. I was gonna pull them out today. I forgot them out. But yeah, you can use them for all different things. And you know, they've been around for a long time. In early civilizations from Mesopotamia to Egypt, pottery has become a highly developed craft. And they used to, you know, in the Bible times, they used them to haul water. They used them to store things in. And until they had a glaze, I mean, flower pots can fall apart pretty easily too. They're porous and the water evaporates and which makes them great for plants because then they, they breathe. But if they, you know, it doesn't work too good for milk and other things and it kind of gets in there and eventually they deteriorate and they fall apart. So they developed a glaze about, glaze about 9th century BC for, for tile, but they end up using it for clay pots. And during the 6th century, Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, there's a lot of pots from that era still around because of that glaze and how they fired them up and took care of them. So pottery was used for storing liquids, like I said, or oil or fruits or grain. And as they have dug up and done a lot of archaeology, they found out they baked with them and used them a lot of times that way. But in the times of Paul and 2 Corinthians, clay pots were used for all those kinds of things. And so when Paul was talking about having a treasure in a clay pot, they understood what he was talking about. And we too are able to do that because as I've said, as we've talked about, we've seen, we know what clay pots are as well. So we're gonna be looking at 2 Corinthians chapter four, verses seven to 12. You can find that on page 937 of your pew Bibles if you wanna follow along with the Bible. Otherwise the scripture should be up behind me. But it says, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive and are always, be, are always being given over to the death of Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. Paul begins with, but. And so actually we need to look back on verse 6. So if you have your Bibles open, it says in verse 6, for God who said, let there be light in the darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts so we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. God has made this light, the light of Jesus Christ, shine in our hearts so we can know God's love and God's glory. That same glory that was seen in the face of Jesus. And as we talked about a few weeks ago, the face of Moses had a glow about it. He, he, when he was with Jesus, his face glowed when he was with God in the tabernacle. And that same glow, that same light, God wants to put inside of us. And that's his Holy Spirit. Earlier in Paul's first letter, he addressed the Spirit of God in us, and he said, the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but he considers them foolishness and can't understand them because they're discerned only through the Spirit. So for us, people that believe in Jesus Christ, when we hear God's Word, it makes sense. I mean, we can learn it and we and can start to understand it. But if you don't know God, if you don't know Jesus, God's Word sounds like foolishness. It seems like just so many fairy tales as um, Dean was sharing with us. But when we know Jesus Christ, those things aren't foolish anymore. Without the Spirit, we can't understand. So people like Jim Elliot, when he said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. 
to a lot of people that would sound pretty foolish because Jim Elliott went down to South America and worked with the Alka Indians and his, him and a team of five other men went down to this beach to share the good news of Jesus Christ. And when they got there, they died. They all were killed brutally by the same Indians that they were trying to reach. And so to the world, it looked like idealistic young men that gave their lives for what? I mean, foolishness to many people. To others, it was just a great testimony and it encouraged a lot of Christians to go out onto the field. But what looked like death and foolishness was for God because Elizabeth Elliot, his wife and their daughter, plus Nate Saint's sister and, and, and that family went back to those very same Indians, same people that killed their husband and brother and gave them the good news. And those people, those Alka Indians became Christians because they were willing to go back down there and share the truth with them. Now it looked like foolishness, but God used it for his glory. For the same God that created the light out of nothing, put that light within our hearts. And to the followers of Jesus Christ, the light of the sun, the light of the Holy Spirit gives us the power to live a transformed life, to change. So according to Paul, we have that light of Christ in us if we're believers in Jesus Christ. That light is a treasure so special and powerful from God himself to each one of us. And he put that treasure in jars of clay. You know, basically we came from dirt. We came and we could, we're made of clay. We're made of very, you know, we're all shapes and sizes. Some of us are more beautiful than others. Some of us are, there's all, like I said, all shapes. Some of us are larger or smaller. We come in all different packages, all different ages. I mean, we change, we deteriorate. We're not really anything special. I mean, some of you are really extra special, but most of us are just ordinary and we're just regular and we're just people and we're prone to crack and to crumble. And God puts lights into us, into frail human flesh. He puts his spirit in us so that we can live for him and become beautiful. Each of us is made in the image of God, but our bodies are dying a little bit every day. Now, when we get older and frailer, no matter how hard we try to stay healthy, eventually we, we die. Our bodies will go to the grave. And at the average life expectancy of a U.S. male, in, at, according to 2016, was 78.56 years. And any of us that are older or those of us with aging parents have seen what happens as they get older. Sometimes it seems like there's a switch that just switches and all of a sudden, especially with, like with Gary's mom lately, everything has changed. I mean, a year ago, she could get around really well and still could think. Now, it's not the same. It's hard to watch the progression, but we do change. And we go back to being that dirt eventually on the ground. Yet that same body houses an eternal light that God puts in us if we're believers. The treasure within us is more powerful than any source on planet Earth. It is from God and we can't produce it ourselves. It can only come from him. We can only live it out. That same inner spirit gives us hope for the future. It helps us have strength to endure and all those things that happen in our life. This illustration of Paul shows us that absolute, the absolute insufficiency of the human body, of the human life. We are so frail, yet God puts a life, or all, an eternal treasure inside of us. We can, in, Saul, in Philippians, Paul wrote, we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. Only in him and through him can we truly be free and live in freedom. That's what Paul is trying to tell the Corinthian church. He says to those Corinthians, you don't need to live a wimpy, defeated Christian life. You can be victorious in how you want to live for Jesus because God's Holy Spirit lives inside of you. Christ lives inside of you. Wednesday night, we talked about this a little bit. We talked about the light of a Christian. And we had the kids up here and they all had it. We turned the lights off and they all had flashlights. And we turned on one flashlight. Well, it, it lit up a little bit. I mean, it seemed pretty bright when all the lights were off. But then when you had all the other children that were around, maybe seven or eight of us, all, then when you had all those flashlights on at the same time, it brightened up the whole room. 
Because as a church, that's what God wants for us. He wants us to get together. He wants our, us as believers to be the church. And when, when we're together serving him, we are way more powerful and more victorious than if we're trying to just be an individual light. We can make a big difference in our community and in our world when we work and serve together. So Paul was, Jesus called himself that light. He said, I am the light of the world. And if you follow me, you won't have to walk in the darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. If we follow him, we don't have to walk in the dark. We have that light that leads to life. And he's storing it in clay pots. So he puts the Holy Spirit inside of us, that treasure that lives among us. And so we're strong. We're much stronger than we really think we are. Often, we're stronger because of the struggles that we have went through, the pain that we've endured. We're stronger because there are things out there attacking our faith. There are people out there, there's a culture out there that is attacking our faith. And there's a um, story I found that kind of gives that illustration of what happens with a clay pot and how we can understand this principle better. The story is told of a couple who goes to England to celebrate their 25th wedding anniversary and they love to go antiquing. So they're going out and they're going from shop to shop and they come across this little antique shop and, that's, and they, they have a collection of teapot, teacups at home. And I know there's people that do that, but and so that's what they're doing. They're, they're looking for, and they found this really exquisite, beautiful little teacup. And they asked if they could look at it and they pick it up and when they're picking it up, the teacup, the teacup starts talking. And it wasn't from Beauty and the Beast, but it could have been. But the little teacup talks to him and says, you don't understand. I have not always been a teacup. There was a time when I was just a red lump of clay. And my master took that lump of clay and he started patting it and bending it and moving it and forming it and slapping it. And he patted me all over and I said, don't do that. That hurts. I don't like this. Leave me alone. And he only smiled and he gently said, not yet. Then wham, he placed me on that potter's wheel and he pushed me down, he added some water and he spun me around, I was getting so dizzy. It went around and around and he's forming me and shaping me and it just felt awful and I was getting sick and I yelled, stop, I'm getting dizzy, I'm feeling sick. And the master only nodded quietly and he said, not yet. He spun me around some more and he poked me and made a shape out of me and then he, and then he stopped and then he put me in an oven. Oh, it was hot. It was so hot. I started banging on the door and I said, help get me out of here. I can't be in here. I can't bear it another minute. And he said, not yet. And then, then it felt so good. It was so cool. He got me out of there and I started cooling off. And, and I, then he started, then something stunk. And he started putting this stuff all over my, all over the exterior of my shape. And and it, was, it had a lot of fumes. And I just said, this ain't great. I don't care for this. I, you know, I, stop it, stop it. And the master said, not yet. And then once it dried, he put me back in this oven that was even hotter than the first one. And I baked and I baked and I, just, I thought I was gonna suffocate. And I baked and I pleaded and I screamed and I cried. I was convinced I was gonna die. I wasn't gonna make it. And then just then he took me out put me on the shelf where he cooled. And then I started wondering, what's he gonna do next? And then he handed me a mirror and he said, look at yourself. And he goes, and that little teacup goes, that's not me. I'm beautiful. That can't be me. That's not what I started like. And he said, I want you to remember, I know it hurt to be rolled and pounded and padded and spun around and baked and glazed, but he said, all those things work together to make you the beautiful teacup you are now. He said, if I wouldn't have put you in that oven, you would have cracked. I know the fumes were bad, but if I wouldn't have done that, you wouldn't have had any color in your life. You wouldn't have hardened the way you needed to. And if I hadn't put you back in that second oven for that long of time, that you would not have the hardness to be a teacup and hold, told tea and to be used. Now you are a finished product. Now you are what I had in mind for you first when I started creating you. God creates all sorts of pots in all shapes and sizes, many colors, many cultures, 
Yet we are all made from the same dust of the earth. We're all, we're all made in the image of God. We all start from the same beginning when we can all be filled with his treasure. A pot on a shelf is of no use. That pot stuck in the barn, stored where these were, can, can, can do no good. A pot unused is just an empty pot. And it begins to deteriorate because we have, well, we have this one falling apart, it's losing things, we got a cracked one. And then we have, we have this one. That's what happens when you use them a long, long time. And they do eventually, even with glaze and even with everything else, they crumble and deteriorate and they fall apart. And it's, it's very brittle, it's been shedding all over. And um, that's what happens to us when we're used. When we allow the potter to craft us, to mold us and to shape us, what he needs to use heat and pain to get us to be the people that he wants us to be. Then Paul was talking, then he shared in verses 8 to 10, he said, We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. The enemy, the stuff in our world, the culture, people at work, people at school, people in your communities, in our communities, press back at us. They want us to be more like them. They want us not to be different. They want us to all to be cookie cutters, we all to be the same, all to agree. And that's not what a Christian is called to do. They want us to be a Christian on Sunday and be somebody else, be like them the rest of the week. They're okay if you're a Christian once a week, but they don't really want you to do that all the time. But we are pressured to do things sometimes that God does not want us to do. And that's where God puts that treasure in us, that he gives us the power and the strength to say no. He gives us that light and Paul, and Paul said, you will be crushed. He didn't say it would not happen. He didn't say you might be, but he said you will be crushed. We will all be attacked at one time or another for our faith. Paul said we will be perplexed. We won't understand everything this side of heaven. We won't understand why a child has to die. We won't understand why a young person has to die. We won't understand why God allows things, bad things to happen to good people. But he said he'll be with us through all those things. We can know that Jesus is with us and he'll give us the strength we need to face whatever does happen to us or at us. In Paul's time, people were already dying for their faith. Stephen had already been martyred and been stoned to death. James had already been killed for his faith. Nero thought it was great fun to gather up the Christians and throw them in the Colosseum with a bunch of hungry lions. That's what was going on during the time of Paul. That's what these Christians were facing as they became believers. And then we kind of complain when people make fun of us. When we get feel bad because somebody treats us different because we're a believer. But God will help us no matter where we are, no matter what the persecution, no matter how much it is. And we can feel bad when that happens, but we can remember that the enemy cannot destroy us completely. He may destroy our bodies, but we have an eternal light inside of us that lives forever with God in heaven. And we'll just get to heaven that much sooner if the world outside destroys us. There is nothing the enemy can throw at us that can destroy our salvation and the promise of heaven given to us by Jesus Christ. The enemy cannot destroy us. He'll try. He will try to destroy you as a Christian. If he can't get you, he'll, get us, he'll work at your family. He'll attack whatever is around you. The enemy is real. The more we as a church reach out in our, to our community where Satan already has an active stronghold, we will face resistance. That's the way it is. He, Satan wants to plant seeds of discord in communities. He wants to plant seeds of discord even here in the church between believers. Satan already knows he's lost. He knows at the very end of time, when this is all over, he, he, he didn't win. He, he's already lost it. But on the meantime, between now and then, he wants to take as many people with him as possible. And with believers, he wants to make us, he wants to make you as little use to God as possible. That's his job. That's what he wants to hurt the Savior in any way possible. So the more that he can plant discord, more that he can can work and turn us against each other 
he, he's happy. If Satan can snuff out our lights, if he can make us fearful and hide those lights, those treasures in us, he has done his job. Paul goes on to say, we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may be revealed on our mortal body. For those that follow Jesus, that have said yes to his life and ours, we are carrying his death too. Jesus died for our sins. He paid the price for us. And he defeated death and sin on the cross. His death wasn't easy. It was a sacrifice. We, won't, we would not be filled today with his treasure without him having given himself for us. Our bodies, our clay pots, like we said, will deteriorate over time. We'll look a lot more like that at the end. But that's okay. Because our bodies, though they won't remain the same, our souls and our spirits will continue to grow and to be more like Jesus and reflect his light. There are those among us who, who know that we're defective. We, are, we know we're cracked. I mean, we've had a lot of life that has screwed us up. We have a lot of baggage from our past. We, we just can't figure out why God can use us at all. I mean, well, how can he use us anymore? Well, there's still a plant in here, and it actually still grows, and I still water it. I should move it, but it's, it's a great illustration today. But God can still use a crack pot. God can still use each of us. No matter what our history is, no matter what our past is, he can continue to use us, and he can make something useful out of us. There was a water bearer in India that had two large water pots, and he carried them on his shoulders, and every day he would go down to the, to the stream and get the water for the day for the, for the household. But one of them had a crack in it, and it leaked. So usually by the time he got back to the house, it was only one and a half containers of water. And for two years this was going on, and finally that cracked water pot looked at the servant, and he apologized. He said, I am so sorry that every day you just don't get your money's worth. I mean, you're not getting your work's worth because I'm a crack pot and I keep leaking all the way over from, from the stream to the house. And I am so sorry. And the servant looks at him and he, he doesn't understand. You know, the bearer said to the pot, did you notice? You know, he said, have you ever noticed the flowers? You know, kind of keep an eye on, on the trail today and watch, look at the flowers as we go back to the house. And so, so the pot did, and as they go back, he was watching, yeah, there was beautiful flowers all the way along the road, back up to the master's house. And then he, the pot had no idea why he had to look at the flowers, but he didn't notice them. And he said to the bear when he got there, he goes, yeah, but I still leaked all the way from the stream up to the house. You still only got a half a container of water. And the guy said, he said, did you, have, did you notice that the flowers were only on your side of the road? Because for two years, I realized you had a crack a couple of years ago, and I planted flower seed. And every day when we go back from the stream, you water the plants every single day. And, every, and then I take those flowers, and I pick them, and they grace the master's table. So God used something defective in that pot to make something beautiful, or that bearer did. God uses each of us, too. No matter how cracked we are, no matter how deteriorated we are, God can continue to use us. He puts his light within us. God uses each of us that follow him. When we say yes to Jesus in our lives and follow him, we are a pot filled with the treasure. We may be crumbling, we may have a crack or two, but we're filled with a priceless treasure of Jesus Christ, the treasure that we are to share with others, the gospel of Jesus. We are to tell people about God, a treasure that lasts forever despite the condition of these pots. These will all end up in the junk someday and all, be, all disappear, but still that treasure that's in us will live forever. With that clay pot, today as you leave, we're gonna give you a clay pot to help you to remember. They're back there by Mike right now. Um, but we want you to remember that God has placed a treasure inside of each of you that he wants to use for his glory. And no matter how deteriorated we are, God can, he can redeem us and use us right where we're at. And that's what Paul said, as, as we have this treasure in us, the Holy Spirit lives in us, we are to share that with others. We're not supposed to keep it to ourselves. 
like that cracked pot that watered those flowers, you need to use that light and share that light with somebody else. I think Pastor Chuck last week did a good job of reminding us to share what we believe with others. And that's exactly what Paul is talking about as well. Because this is the good news, Paul wrote. It is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you. Unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. I passed on to you what was most important, what also must be passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. 1 Corinthians 15, 2 and 4. Two to four. Christ himself gave us the sacrament of communion as well. And we are going to celebrate that this morning. Because he wants to remind us that he lived what his sacrifice was, but that he lives within us and that we can live for him. So as we enter communion, I want to share with you from 1 Corinthians again. It says, on the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. And then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes. Paul was